All right, well, hey, everybody, and uh, welcome. Man, I'm so glad that you are joining us today. Uh, I hope you've had just a great week in the Lord. You know, if you missed last week with us, uh, you know, we talked about living a fully surrendered life, fully surrendered to God and His plan and His purpose and, and following Jesus. So we talked about three things uh, that bring us to a place where we respond to God with availability like Isaiah when he says, here I am, send me. You know, God, God, use me. Whatever the cost, whatever the assignment, I'm yours. Says, Isaiah says, I don't even know what it is. My answer in advance is, yes, I'm in. And, you know, for some of you planners, you're hearing that, and that idea is terrifying. Like, you don't like interruptions uh, you can't imagine surrendering that much control, but I'm telling you, when you surrender to God, you win. You win big. What we see as God's interruptions are often opportunities for something better. Everybody say better. Better. Man, have you ever had an experience where you thought something was good until you experienced something better? Like maybe the first time you got bumped to first class or ordered a $5 cup of coffee like you didn't know that it was that much better until you experienced it. Y'all you know, remember the first time that I had good steak. And I'm talking like good steak. I always, I always liked steak, uh, but I don't really had my mom's steak. And the kind of steak my, my mom made uh, was cheap. It was well done. And it was covered in A1 sauce. And I, I liked it that way, honestly. It was good until I was probably 15 or 16. And uh, my brother-in-law uh, took me to an actual steak house. And so I'm sitting there. And honestly, the menu was intimidating. Like I didn't know uh, what cut of meat to order or how it was supposed to be cooked. Uh, but I wanted to play it cool, so I basically just copied my brother's order, got exactly what he got, and it was a medium rare filet mignon. And I'm telling you what, it was indescribably better. Like my life has never been the same since. I don't know how you can call what my mom cooked and what that was both steak because it was so much better. And I'm curious, how many of you like better? Like better? I got to be honest, I love better. And the good news is that God is offering you a better life than this world could ever provide you if you're willing to follow him. Now, the bad news is that so many people are settling for what our culture calls the good life and they're missing out. They don't even know how much they're missing out. Even some people in the church are only living a partially surrendered life. They're trusting God with their salvation, but they're not fully surrendered to Him. They're not enjoying the best that God has for them. They're not fully following Him. And I'm just going to be really blunt for a moment because uh, there's some of you, you're watching right now, and like God is calling you to let go of the good life so you can grab hold of the better life. The life that is truly life. I'm telling you, you're never going to enjoy filet mignon if you keep ordering cheap, well-done steak. And I think one of the saddest stories in the Bible that probably represents a lot of people today is found in Mark chapter 10 and verse 17. Jesus was starting on his way when a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Like, well, what do I got to do? How do I earn this? And Jesus answers him. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You know, don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. To this the man declared, teacher, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. And like, I, I've done it. I've followed the commands. But Jesus looks through his outward obedience and all of his rule following, and he looked into the condition of this young man's heart, and he saw a problem, something that I think, honestly, this guy didn't even know he had. 
And so Jesus says something to this young man that he doesn't say to everybody else. He says in verse 21, he looked at him, and Scripture says Jesus loved him. Okay, Jesus loved him, and because he loved him, he says, listen, one thing you lack. Okay, you've got all this, you've kept all these rules. One thing you lack, he says, go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. But at this, verse 22 says, the man's face fell. And he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Like, I mean, he was living the good life. He had material possessions. He had security from his wealth. He had position in society. And because he was unwilling to let go of the good life, oh, he missed out on something so much better. I mean, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, says, hey, let go of the temporary things of this world and you can have eternal treasure. You can follow me. Jesus in the flesh says, come follow me. Come be my disciple. Like talk about the opportunity of a lifetime. But this rich young man chose what he thought was good over what was better. And scripture says that he went away sad. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 38, Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. She's just sitting here in the presence of Jesus, listening to Jesus, hanging out with Jesus. I'm doing all this work. I'm getting stuff done. I'm making it happen. And in verse 41, Jesus responds and he says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and you're upset about many things. But only one thing is needed and Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. You know, over and over again, Jesus calls us to, to rest, to be with him. Like, he has something better than just being stressed out and worried and panicked and overwhelmed by the to-do list. He says, come to me. Follow me. Choose what is Better. Maybe you're here and you can really relate to Martha because honestly, you're worried about so many things and you're distracted by so many things. But Jesus is saying to you, listen, one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. You know, David in Psalm 84 says that one day in the presence of God, it's better than a thousand days anywhere else. One day in God's presence. I told you last week that in order to, to get to that place where we're fully surrendered, in order to, to wholeheartedly follow Jesus, in order to enjoy a life that is better, you need to experience the presence of God. I mean, this, it is vital to the Christian life and enjoying the fruit of the Spirit. And honestly, I was going to preach something different today, but I really felt led uh, man, to go back and unpack this a little bit more because it is, it's so powerful uh, for every believer. And so if you would, uh, turn with me to Psalm 84, where David, uh, the psalmist, David is talking to God, and he says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. And then I love this language. He says, My soul yearns. Even faints for the courts of the Lord. Now, if you're new to the Bible, you may wonder like, what that means. Why would my soul yearn for the courts of the Lord? Like, What is that? Well, anytime you read in the Old Testament, uh, you read that phrase, it represents the presence of God because God would dwell in the temple. And so the people would go into the courts to get as close to God's presence as they possibly could. 
That's why it says, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. It says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And then if we skip uh, down to verse 10 of Psalm 84, he says, better is one day in your courts, in your presence, God, than a thousand days anywhere else. He says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. Like this is a lowly position, but he says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And man, I just love David uh, in the Bible. He's the guy that wrote most of the Psalms. And uh, he was just a cool guy. You probably heard about the little shepherd boy who defeated uh, Goliath, this giant warrior, and became the king of Israel. And not only was he was a great warrior, but he was a great musician. He was a songwriter. A lot of the songs that we sing today uh, were originally written by David. Uh, but I think my favorite description of David and probably the highest honor bestowed on David is that he was called a man after God's own heart. And we see him over and over and over again desperate for the presence of God, prioritizing the presence of God in his life, recognizing his need. In fact, in Psalm 27 and uh, verse 4, he says, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. He says, if I just have one thing, man, I want to be with God, His presence. I need His goodness to know that He's with me always. If there's one thing I need in the good times... It's God if there's one thing I need in the bad times. It's God if there's one thing he says that I desire above everything else. It's to dwell in the presence of the living God. And I'm telling you, if you seek the presence of God, you will find more contentment than anything this world could ever bring you. You'll find peace that passes all human understanding. You'll find strength that is greater than your own. You'll find faith that can move mountains, rest for your soul, hope that is everlasting in the presence of God. You'll find joy that is unspeakable. If your greatest desire is to be with Him, if you're seeking Him, if you're drawing near to Him, man, He will provide what you need. Psalm 103 says that He forgives all your sins, He heals all your diseases, redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion, that he satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Second Peter 1 and verse 3 tells us that his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. No matter what's going on in your life, Romans 8 says that in all things, He's working for the good of those who love Him. His grace is sufficient. His word is enough. His presence is exactly what you need. I'm telling you, one day with God is indescribably better than a thousand days anywhere else. Now, I'm not saying that you'll never have trials and that you never have a hard time that everything's going to go your way. Jesus said in John 16, 33, that in this world you will have trouble. But he says, take heart, because I've overcome the world. And in me, with me, you will have peace. David knew this in the middle of life struggles, in the middle of persecution, that he needed the presence of God. And I tell you what, I'd rather be on a boat in the middle of a storm with Jesus than on the shore without him, because a day with him is better than a thousand anywhere else. So practically, how do we have a day with God? You know, what does this look like? Some of you might say, well, that's easy. You go to church or you read your Bible or you set aside, you know, daily time to pray, to listen to worship music. And I would say, good answer. All of those things are great. But I want to maybe broaden your understanding just a little bit. And rather than just having compartmentalized time with God, 
you can live with an ongoing, unending awareness of God's presence. Okay, more than just having a, a vision like Isaiah did or, or one moment in God's presence that you remember, you can have an ongoing, unending awareness of His presence because Scripture says that He's omnipresent, that He's always there. The very same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in every believer. You know, in the Old Testament, God would dwell in the temple and you'd have to go somewhere to be with God. And that's why people long to be in the temple courts. In the New Testament, for those of you who are Christians, the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go somewhere to be with God. God has come to be with you. You know, but some of you aren't living with that awareness. And you're missing out. You know, maybe even some of you, you Christians, you have your devotional time or your spiritual time, and then you have your normal time, you know, the, the rest of your day. Like you've made a distinction. You kind of almost created a barrier in your thinking. Others of you spend an hour a week at church with God, and then there's the rest of the week, and you're just hanging on until next Sunday. But what I'm saying is instead of just compartmentalize time with God, which is important. You should have those times that are set aside and regular. But instead of this thinking of just compartmentalize time with God, you can literally do life, live your life with an ongoing, unending awareness of His presence. And to help you do that, I want to quickly give you a couple habits to develop. And I'm telling you, if you're intentional to incorporate these disciplines into your life, you will discover that it is better to live life in the presence of God. So the first thing, if you're taking notes, then I really want to encourage you to develop the habit of constant communication with God. Constant communication. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Be joyful always and pray continually. Some translations say to pray without ceasing. In other words, pray all of the time. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds impossible, right? I mean, some of you are kind of like ADD when it comes to prayer and you're easily distracted. Like, I get it. I've uh, been there. There's times where I'm praying and 30, thing, 30 seconds in, I'm like thinking about what's for lunch. Like, oh God, you can do miracles. Yes, you are a miracle working God, and I need a miracle. Miracle whip goes great on a turkey sandwich. I think I'll go make one. You're just like, boom, just like that. And you may think, like, I can't even pray for five minutes, Pastor. Uh, how in the world can I pray continually? But I believe with all of my heart that you can develop constant communication with God. Like, how many of you carry a smartphone with you? Like, maybe you're watching right now from your phone. It's almost always with you in your pocket, in your purse, on your desk, in your watch. You know, and how many of you, like, carry it into the bathroom? Okay, that's gross. You need help. Uh, you can, like, get some counseling. I'll go with you because I carry mine in there too. But, but because of this little device, most of us are connected to other people all the time. We talk all day long in short bursts of communication, like social media, Email, texting, phone calls, right? Just short bursts of communication all throughout the day. And then sometimes uh, we spend hours at a time talking with people. Just, you know, the time goes away. And so I want you to think about your communication with God the same way. That it doesn't just have to be an hour of spiritual warfare in the morning. It doesn't just have to be God bless this meal or the prayer before bed, but you can have these short bursts of communication uh, ongoing all the time, constantly, consistently throughout the entire day. I mean, just, just constantly as you're going into that meeting, God, would you give me wisdom? God, would you give me the words to speak? You know, as you uh, encounter that person, man, who's been really really cruel to you and is really and you just say oh god would you give me grace god would you would you help me to love them the way that you do god i pray blessings on them you know as your as your patience is being tested and you're at your breaking point you know oh god would you give me 
Give me your fruit right now, the fruit of your spirit in my life. You know, God, help me in my word. You know, whatever it is, just constant communication all throughout the day. God, thank you for this beautiful afternoon. God, thank you for this, uh, this time with my kids. God, thank you. And, and next thing you know, you're just you're praying without ceasing. You've just developed this ongoing, unending awareness of the presence of God. And you're talking to Him about anything. And you're talking to Him about everything. And guess what? You're having a day with God. Not just compartmentalized time, but literally, you're having a day with God. If you can have a day, you can have a week. If you can have a week, you can have a month. If you have a month, you can have a year. If you can have a year, you can do life with an ongoing, unending awareness of God's presence. So develop the habit of constant communication. And number two, develop a daily desperation for God. You know, I want you to think about what the psalmist said earlier in, in Psalm 84, verse 2. He says, my soul yearns for you. My heart faints for the living God. And I'm curious, those of you who are Christians, when is the last time that you were desperate for the presence of God? And you just cried out, God, my soul yearns for you. God, my heart faints for you. God, I need you. Maybe some of you are there right now. Others of you, maybe you've never sought the presence of God like that before. Or maybe some of you, you're remembering back to when you first got saved or, or that time at camp or a couple years ago. You know, but you're not there and now. You're wondering, like, why is that? Well, you develop an appetite for what you eat. And here's the deal, when we feed on the things of this world, the good life, the American dream, we develop an appetite for the good life. God has something better. You know, if all you ever eat is cheap, well-done steak covered in A1, all you're ever going to want is cheap, well-done steak. When there is a medium-rare filet mignon available to you, I'm telling you, it's way, way better. If all you do is seek what this world has, all you're going to desire is what this world gives. But if you start to seek God, you're going to develop a daily desperation for him. Scripture says in Psalm 34 and verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. And as you taste on him, suddenly, uh, man, you become desperate for more. I know that's been true for me, that the more time I spend in God's presence, uh, the more hungry I am to be in his presence. The more time I spend in his word, man, the more that I want to feed my heart and my soul and my mind the truth of his goodness. In fact, this is what David says in Psalm 63 and verse 1. He says, God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Oh, I've seen you in the sanctuary, and I've beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, he says, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help I sing in the shadow of your wings my soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me you get this picture that he was constantly in communication with God that he was desperate daily 
for the presence of God. And when you're living like that and you're feeding on his word and you're enjoying his presence, you'll realize that, that he is better, that his truth is better, that his forgiveness, his grace, his power, his mercy, his sovereignty, his presence is so much better that you won't want to settle for anything else. Oh, better is one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand days elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Psalm 84.10, would you say that with me? Better is one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And God, right now, I just thank you for your presence and your goodness. God, that when we seek you, we find you. God, that we, when, when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And God, I pray in your church, God, that you'd stir up a hunger. Father God, a daily desperation to be in your presence, to encounter you. God, that we wouldn't simply rely on church once a week but we would have this daily desperation that we would live in constant communication constant awareness of your presence of your goodness God that's what you're calling us to to follow you to be in the yoke with you it's how we learn the unforced rhythms of your grace is by being with you And God, would you teach us to do that? Would you teach us to live that? God, would we, be, would we be men like David after your own heart? That we'd be women like Mary. That choose to sit at the feet of Jesus and be with you and enjoy your presence rather than just scurry around getting the to-do list done. God, that you would take priority over everything else. We don't have to live a life of worry and anxiety. We don't have to be stressed out and burnt out and frantically chasing the things of this world. Even our basic needs, what we'll eat, drink, what we'll wear. He made us a promise in Matthew 6. He said, seek me first my kingdom and right righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. God, help us to seek you first, to seek you foremost. And God, I just pray for some that right now in this moment, are choosing to surrender their life and surrender their plan and their priorities to you. God, to let go of some things that have been holding them back from really following you. And enjoying all that you have for them. God, that today would be the day that this would be the moment where they give you everything. They trust you. And maybe there's some of you you're watching right now and Jesus is inviting you to come to him to accept the gift of his grace. Maybe for the very first time, maybe you're coming back to him. But he's offering to take all of your sin, your guilt, your shame, and remove it as far as the east is from the west. He's offering to make you new, to lead you into a life that is not only better, but it's eternal. Life that never ends with him and his glory. And I wonder if today in this moment that you would accept his invitation and choose 
what is better. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Jesus, I recognize that you died on the cross for me. That you paid the penalty for my sins. So that I could follow you. And be like you. And be forgiven and be free. So today I surrender my heart and my life to you. Make me new and help me to live for you. Help me to know your voice and know your presence all the days of my life. In your precious name, amen.